Hi, welcome to the virtual tour for Woodland Hills Private School. I'm Seth Posey, head of school. Hi, I'm JC Dexter. I'm the elementary school principal. We're going to take a few minutes today to walk you around campus and help you get acquainted with our school and also share a little bit more about our program with you. So we want to start by walking you around campus. We're going to look at some of the modifications that are in place right now during the COVID-19 pandemic, but also we want to share with you what our school looks like in non-COVID times because we will eventually get back to non-COVID times. This is a kindergarten classroom that was set up before COVID-19. You'll see that there are a lot of flexible learning spaces in our school, and some of those have been a little bit reimagined during COVID just with safety in mind. We'll show you a couple pictures from COVID times. It looks a little bit different right now. This is from a publishing celebration, which is something JC will talk a little bit more about. And then this is that same classroom set up with COVID safety in mind. So this is from this year. You can see it's a smaller group of children. It's not our best favorite uh, to have every kid sitting at their own individual, but they are spaced out a little bit more. So that's, you know, what you might expect going into the fall. Because there is a little bit more sitting this year, we're also bringing in more mindfulness and yoga, and you can see they're doing a brain break here. So we're trying to keep the kids moving around a lot. But during COVID times, um, just to house our normal number of families, we did have to put up some portable classrooms. So you'll see they're kind of like the great British baking show tents, but, and they do have heat and air conditioning. We roll up the sides, it's just more safe during COVID anyway. As we kind of think about how we've tried to keep school as normal for kids during COVID as possible. All the classrooms have their own assigned tables. Each class cohort has its own bathroom. So they're not sharing spaces with other kids, but you can see our maintenance team built these clear dividers on all the picnic tables so that kids can sit across from one another when they're eating um, or if they're doing a lesson outside and still have that normal um, conversation with safety in mind. JC will talk a little bit more about the special area classes, all of those are happening now. So this was a picture from their Jackson Pollock um, project in uh, kindergarten art. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the barnyard and how that's used here in, at our school. This was a, a pre-COVID picture, but you can see the kids are, are having barnyard um, class that's part of their science. For those of you with younger kids, the TK kindergarten and first grade has their own playground. So kids that age are still developing their balance and vestibular system. They need a lot more climbing uh, equipment. There's a rope bridge in the back. They have bikes out there. So that playground is designed specially for them. Who are we as a school and what are we all about? So this program is designed with a lot of creative expression in mind. We really like to think of elementary school as being more like a liberal arts program. We're trying to expose kids to a lot of different disciplines and a lot of different things so they can figure out what they're interested in, what they're good at, maybe what they're not so good at and have a plan for how to deal with that as well. This slide is a little bit wordy, but if you'll go with me for a second, I just really want to emphasize how this program might look different than how most of us, myself included, were educated. So we are a more progressive leaning school. Being a more progressive school means that there's a lot of emphasis on the process and not just the product. So yes, kids get scores on things and especially the older kids will take tests and quizzes at times, but a lot of the emphasis is on teaching skills that you can transfer to your life in the future. But when we teach persuasive writing, even to kindergartners, the emphasis is on, yes, we're gonna have this wonderful project and share it with people, but we wanna teach them how to use those persuasive skills now and for the rest of their life and not just to get a grade and throw it in the trash. A lot of this program is really rooted in what's called a learning continuum, or it's just a learning progression that was developed at Columbia Teachers College. And so for reading, writing, and spelling, we follow this progression to be able to know what each kid needs. The old school approach is the textbook is the source for everything. And just like an encyclopedia is not necessarily the best source for everything in life, if you only work off of the textbook, you're assuming that every single kid in that kindergarten class has the same learning needs, which I can tell you is not true. A lot of these things over on the right-hand side bleed together, but to use this learning continuum, we do a lot of what's called formative assessment. Those are observational assessments. It could be a one-on-one -on -one sitting down with the student and observing their reading behaviors. 
we do these special spelling tests where they're not designed for kids to get all the words right. It's designed for us to figure out what they don't know yet so we can identify their spelling level. These formative assessments are used so that when we decide what we want to teach kids, it's really carefully designed based on their needs and not just based on their age. That PBL just stands for project-based learning. A lot of emphasis on critical thinking and some of these things like asking essential questions, this isn't revolutionary. It doesn't require a lot of special training to ask kids bigger questions that matter to them. Like when we're studying all the conflict throughout social studies, conflict throughout history, we focus on topics like, well, why would these people want to rise up against their leaders? And connecting history to January 2021, there's a lot of meaningful and juicy stuff to talk about. Part of project-based learning is within these topics that we're going to study in school, we're not teaching things that are so radically different than other schools, but how do we teach it? Well, we give them a lot of background information, and then we help kids choose a subtopic that they're really excited about and they want to learn about and teach back to the class. We ask kids to take a stance on things. So in kindergarten, if we're talking about Columbus or the first Thanksgiving, we will ask kids, well, was this person a hero or a villain? Simple things like that that can really make the, the conversation much more meaningful for them. And then in that same vein, we teach kids about what we call accountable talk, which is a friendly way to debate when you don't always agree on things as, as people won't always. So it's not what we teach, it's just how we teach it. Some of these things don't require so much special training, and then some of them do. So in order to run the reading program the way that we run it, there is a lot of specialized training that is required of our teachers. And then the last piece, just in understanding who we are as a school, is our elementary program does follow a social emotional curriculum. This isn't a nice to have, we think of it as a must have. And so we schedule this into their school day as a class. They have morning meeting every day, which is the, that first block of time in the morning. It's a dedicated social skills block. Other components of this approach, we do rule creation with the kids. So at the beginning of the year, every class has a constitutional convention. They sit down and come up with the rules they want to be governed by. We spend a lot of time when they're young, four, five, and six-year-olds, helping them remember to follow those rules they created and using logical consequences if they don't. So we work with them to basically just, how will you fix this problem that happened? And the last piece that's part of this social emotional curriculum is interactive modeling. Everything gets a fancy name. All this means is teaching kids what's expected before we expect it of them. You wouldn't think that, that when kids come into fourth or fifth grade that you need to teach them how we carry the chairs in our school. But actually, if you go back to anything that's a basic routine, if you invest time in the beginning teaching them what's expected, we show it to the students. How do we put the laptops away? We demonstrate it. We ask them what they notice. We have someone else demonstrate. If you invest that time in the beginning, there's so much less wasted time throughout the year. And also, you're teaching kids these positive behaviors. They want to do the right thing. It's just they don't always know what it is. So there's a lot of this more proactive approach to, to teaching kids what's expected and how we're going to treat each other at school. And then the last piece of it, of course, is morning meeting. So again, this is a pre-COVID picture, but it's done through games and songs and activities. There's a lot of emphasis on things like active listening skills, but that first half an hour of their day in every uh, grade level starts with morning meeting. We think it's really important when we talk about progressive education that we really back it up with some examples so you understand what it looks like. Now that Mr. Posey's talked about the why we do what we do, I'm here to talk a little bit more about the how it is we do what we do inside of our classrooms. One of the first things we do with reading is give every kid a running record. This is going to assign each individual student their own reading level. And what that does is inform the teacher on what are those specific set of skills that the student needs to learn to grow as a reader. This picture, pre-COVID times, is an example of meeting with a student one-on-one -on -one to establish a reading level. And then we know what they need to learn as a reader to continue to grow. During COVID times, we value these one-on-one -on -one assessments so much, we wanted to make sure that we were still incorporating them. So what it looks like in a classroom now are having some of those plexiglass partitions so we didn't have to take that part of our program away just because of COVID. Here's an example of what you might see for a typical kindergartner's learning progression. You can see the specific set of skills down here that a teacher is looking for when a student reads a simple sentence, my dog ate my homework. 
Another example for a second and third grade class, you can see the example of a skill that the students are learning over here where students are learning to react to the stories that they're reading because that's what good readers do. And then they'll go back and practice it on their own in a book that's at their highest level of interest along with their specific reading level. Our writing is done in a similar fashion. We start every unit of writing with what we call an on-demand assessment. This is where the teachers are getting a sample of writing from the student that is uh, before any specific instruction is taught. This is going to help our teacher identify what are the skills that the whole group needs to learn, along with the skills that an individual student needs to learn. Then throughout their unit of study, they'll be instructed directly on those skills. One of the really cool things that we do, our reading and writing are always done uh, in the similar units of study. So if they're reading nonfiction books, they're writing nonfiction writing. So they might be doing informational reports, they might be doing how-to writing. Similarly, if they're reading speeches and editorials, they might be working on writing persuasive essays. And then one of the most important things we do at the end is publish to an authentic audience. The last thing we want our students to do is put in all of this hard work just to end up in the trash can in your kitchen. So we have our students complete a publishing party at the end of every unit of study. Trigger warning again, this is pre-COVID times where we have all of our family and friends come in for students to present back their writing works. During COVID times, publishing parties don't go away. They just look a little different. We do a lot of them virtually, pre-recorded over Facebook Live. And if you're curious, one of our kindergarten publishing celebrations is linked below for your viewing. We use the Singapore math program, which looks a little bit different than what you might be used to in a traditional school setting with a big focus on critical thinking and being individualized for the individual learner. Here's a typical example of a first grade student. My student on the left side is a typical first grade learner. There's a lot of picture clues, there's a lot of scaffolding. They're really only solving the last step of the problem. If we have a student that's able to take on greater layers of complexity, we might give them the problem on the right. You'll notice the pictures are gone, the scaffolding is gone. They really have to tap into those critical thinking skills to be able to accomplish the problem solving. The way we approach fluency also looks a little bit different than what you or I might be used to from our schooling back in the day. With our fluency, we really wanna focus on the being able to efficiently manipulate numbers. So you'll notice on the left side example here, we're not just talking about students memorizing numbers one through 10 and counting up and counting down. We're looking for them to be flexible in their thinking, finding the missing numbers, identifying the pattern if it's skip counting, so that they have a greater understanding of the numbers themselves versus just memorizing facts for those time tests. We're also focusing on students to build um, their fluency against their personal best. We're not comparing students to each other inside the classroom. We really want to instill that growth mindset with our kids that they want to achieve more the next time they have another fluency practice. And of course, you can't talk about Woodland Hills Private School without talking about the barnyard, one of my favorite places. You'll notice on the bottom, we have our picture of Chirpy and Patrick, two of our local residents. They were laid here, incubated in our science room, and hatched here and raised. They still reside outside in our barn. It's not for students just to visit the animals. We want students to have a meaningful experience when they're in our science and nature center. For our elementary kids, they'll go through three strands of study, a study of evolution genetics, ecology, and along with animal husbandry, and then they'll revisit these topics in upper elementary, digging a little bit deeper into each topic. We also start engineering challenges early on. We want our students to learn how to communicate effectively with each other and problem solve together early and often. So here's an example of our students working together to build a sugar cube bridge where they were given the supplies and the constraints and asked to build the strongest bridge that they could. They had to learn to communicate with each other and problem solve without just walking away. The reason we do this, by the time they're in fifth grade, we expect them to take those skills and apply them to problems with more complexity. This is an example of our fourth and fifth grade students working to build their Vex IQ robotic, robots. We uh, expect them to be able to not only build the robots and partners, but also be able to program them and solve problems and obstacle courses. In addition to our core curriculum, students will also take part in Spanish, music, 
PE, art, technology, and our science and nature studies. And one of the most critical pieces that we use in our school is our leadership binder. Since we have students working at their own individual levels, this is a key tool for us to be able to track and plan each student's individual growth. They're so important that we even close schools to or close school two times a year for two days for your student to be able to walk you through what their strengths are, what their growth opportunities are, and come up with a plan for what their next set of goals is for the next trimester. Thank you so much for joining us on our virtual tour today. All of my contact information is listed below. I look forward to connecting with you all and working with your student along with your family and I hope to talk to you soon.